Hello, my name's Tom Ryan and it's my pleasure to interview Mark Hartley on the subject of his new film, Not Quite Hollywood, a documentary about so-called Ausploitation cinema. At what point did you tr decide that there was a project in translating your passion for these films, yeah. or for Australian let's call it Australian genre film. I know it's called Ausploitation. I'm, I'm thinking of Well, then, I, then I want to define it because yeah. Ausploitation to me speaks of uh, I Spit on Your Grave, yeah. um, a film which I love, uh, by the way. Right. Uh, I love it formally, yeah. the fact the way the camera actually stays back and watches well, these Well, let's say, let's say something like Street Trash then that you, you can't defend. <laughs> okay. Or Blood Sucking Freaks. Um, yeah. Uh, look, I think what uh, the most interesting thing that no one has ever really addressed is that, I don't know if this happened, you might be able to tell me, I don't know if this happened anywhere else in the world, but in Australia in the 70s, our art house films became our mainstream films. People embraced our art house films, and the films that we were making that would have been considered our commercial mainstream films anywhere else in the world suddenly got relegated to be our B movies. Mm. And I think that's why they're considered exploitation because our mainstream films became our underbelly exploitation cinemas in, cinema in Australia. And that's why I think the term fits, because they were never conceived as mainstream films in Australia. Even though they had the bigger budgets and they had the mainstream subject matter, or the mainstream audience subject matter, they were considered our B-movies. So I think that's why, in Australia at least, Ausploitation does actually make sense, because our genre films, yeah. our sex, our horror, our action, our thrillers, were considered embarrassments. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the, the kinds of terms that you use to describe genre cinema are always critical categories mm. that get lumped onto a group mm. of films, you know, that would never necessarily have occurred to the filmmakers yeah. when they're actually making them. And look, you know, films like Uptown Saturday Night are considered blaxploitation movies. Yeah. You know? So... Yeah. So, at, at what point does this become your project? Uh, you know, the, the, the film that you're going to make? I mean, how, how long is it in the making for you? Uh, probably about 10 years, really, off and on. When I was doing clips, I managed to work with a lot of old school crew. I, I, I sought out old school crews to work with just to talk about these films. And they all had amazing stories. And obviously, I'd heard all Richard's stories. Pardon me. I'd, um, I just thought that there was a really interesting doco. And it started out as a TV show. That Around about that time, there was a show that Jonathan Ross hosted called The Incredibly Strange Film Show where oh. he profiled American exploitation directors. There was an episode on Russ Meyer, there was an episode on um, uh, Ted V. Mickles, people like that, yeah. just uh, cr crazy kind of people. And I thought, you could do something like that in Australia. You could have one on Le Monde, you could have one on Tim <laughs> Burstall, you could do one on Tony Ganane, yes. you could do one on Brian, you could do one on... on you know, Gana Le Monde could encompass... Uh, sorry, um, Ganane could encompass... Richard and Everett DeRoche and all those people. So there'd be a really interesting six-parter there, yes. one on Philippe Mora. And that's how it was originally shopped around as, a, as a, an episode per person. And, and this um, is 10 years ago. This is 10 years ago. Yeah. And um, we, nothing really happened. No one was really interested. And uh, there were, then I got a, a couple of years later, someone from the ABC rang me and said, we, we're thinking of putting knock, making Knock What Hollywood. I said, fantastic. Unfortunately, we want, it, we want to have Bob Down present it. And, uh, and I, it just sounded like they were turning into Australia's funniest films of the yeah. 70s. And that's exactly what I didn't want to happen with it. And so I just said no. And um, I just put it to rest. Yeah. And... Um, at the, around the same time, I read an article with Tarantino where he spoke about his love of a couple of titles. And so I, I, this must have been a... It happened almost concurrently with um, the Kill Bill, with him coming out to Australia for Kill Bill right. Volume 2 and dedicating, he dedicated that to his favourite Australian genre film. And I wasn't there, but from what I understand, everyone in the audience was expecting him to say Mad Max and George yeah. Miller. And he said, Brian Trenchard, Smith and Turkey shoot. <laughs> this is in Sydney. This is in Sydney, Sydney yeah. yeah. And so I, I got Tarantino's assistant's email and just sent him an email saying, look, this project's dead in the water, but I've got this 100-page um, research document. You might enjoy reading it. And there was nothing more than that. I didn't... 
it wasn't to entice him to the project, it wasn't to reinvent the project, it wasn't to do anything like that, it was just I thought he'd like to read it. Mm. And I got an email back the next day saying, Quentin's read your document from cover to cover. Whatever you need him to do to help get the project up, he'll do. Come on over. I'm relieved to hear he can read. Well, maybe he had someone <laughs> read it to him. Uh, I've seen his handwritten scripts. He yes? certainly can't write. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, well, he can write, but in a, in a very kind of personal Tarantino-esque way. <laughs> way. Yeah. Um, so we got on a plane and flew straight over and shot three hours with him. And at that point, I think it was till still a TV series. Yeah. And we got him to do a pitch to the funding bodies. And in the pitch to the funding bodies, he said, I look forward to this showing on a movie screen near me. And that's when I went, that's a bloody good idea. Right. And um, suddenly it all made sense for me. And I thought, we can try to get this up as a feature film because we can then have the money to do it properly. We can travel around the world, interview everyone we want to interview. And we can really get these films looking as good as they ever have. Because one of the things I always disliked about a majority of the documentaries I'd seen about making films is that they could never really find the good film materials. They end, end up using going off TV one inches or they used film trailers which were so yeah. battered. But the films sounded fantastic but they always looked awful. So I said straight from the start I want to go back to the original film materials like we did with all the DVD stuff I was putting out and transfer them to HD and get the films looking as good as they ever have on the big screen because that's the most important thing about the yeah. doco to show these films to show the audiences that these films were made with a lot of craft and that they looked amazing on the big screen hmm. so anyway so we did that and I, we came back from Tarantino and I thought we're up there's no way in the world they'll say no to this film so no. the funding came easily obviously yeah came very easily three years later so um, it, it was a chore after that convincing people that that Tarantino was a draw card, which I found amazing. I just kept on saying, you don't understand. Mm. Even if you don't understand this project and you're not into this project, you have to understand that people the world over follow Tarantino and if he tells you to watch a Mario Bava movie, you'll watch a Mario Bava movie. If he tells you to watch a Henry Silva Mafia movie, you'll track down a Henry Silva <laughs> Mafia movie. Here, he's telling people to watch Australian films. Why would you not want to see a documentary with Tarantino telling the world about Australian cinema? And um, ultimately, Tarantino did help us because even though it didn't help us secure the big slice of money we needed here straight away, it got us a, a really decent pre-sale overseas from England and yeah. America that basically kick kick-started or, or really, uh, you know, was the impetus for the money, the big money here. So wh why couldn't you get? Why couldn't you get money straight off here? What? What? Was, oh, look, I think there's a lot of look. Here. There's a lot of reasons. We 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 had a lot of support from. We got money from Film Victoria, from SBS, from Madman straight away. Right. But we needed the FFC money. We got a letter of intent. We'd gone through evaluation. We got a letter of intent. They, the people on the ground level, really loved the project. We found our financing to trigger the rest of the money from the letter of intent, and then we had to go to the FFC board which is made up of, of people in the industry outside the FFC. Mm. And the board kept on finding better projects that they preferred um, for quite a few rounds. We had Ross and Tate at the FFC really pushing hard for us, but every time they would have a reluctance from the board to invest in this project. And look, I can well understand why. It's a documentary film. It's being made in Australia. Documentaries made anywhere in the world don't find big audiences, with the minor exception of a few. Mm. Um, I was an unproven filmmaker and obviously they kept on finding more important subject matter that they wanted to invest in and we were a documentary. They kept on having decent budgeted films that would come up to the board that had actors with start and stop dates that had to get funded or they would fall apart and they kept on thinking that our project would just keep moving along and would eventually get up but we didn't have you know, time constraints like everything else. And I kept on trying to explain to them that every time we got put off another board meeting, another interviewee died. Um, so, you know, the money came through and having, for all the drama that it took to get the money and all the drama it took to get the film up, in the end, the project was blessed. You know, we, 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 we found all the right people we wanted to talk to. It was the right time, it seemed, in the zeitgeist to do a project like this. Mm. And if we had a shot when we originally wanted to shot, we, 
you know, if everything had have worked out the way it was originally planned, I don't think we would have been the opening film at Melbourne, for sure. Mm. And, um, you know, in the end, through all the, every, I look, everything I do, I do differently next time, but we were blessed. Yeah. Did, did, did you have to persuade the people who were involved in the project who were to become your interviewees? Did you have to work hard to get them to tell their no. stories? Or? No, that was, a, that was the most surprising. I mean, it wasn't surprising, it was really nice in a way that no one would... I thought that there'd be a lot of people who'd be embarrassed by having to talk about this stuff or wouldn't want to talk about this stuff. And it was the exact opposite. People were so keen. Yeah. And that was because no one had really spoken to them about these films. And they had a great affection for these films. And um, it's interesting that uh, a large majority of what remains about these films, with the exception of this documentary now, was just the critics' responses. There was no real um, st stories. And I, I should say that that's not quite true, because when you read cinema papers now, the back issues of cinema papers, there were amazing in-depth articles on the sets of all these films, mm. a lot written by yourself, Tom. Some but, interviews, yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, But what... But what was really remained in, in, in people's recognition, I think, was just the critics' response to these films. And in a way, that wasn't necessarily representative of the audience's response. Um, or or the, the people involved, their yeah. stories. And so in a way, um, you know, something like this hopefully does... You know, I think the good thing about Not Quite Hollywood is that when you put it alongside, um, you know, Anthony Buckley's really fantastic documentaries on on our nostalgic wave of films, you kind of, in a way, do get a complete history of Australian cinema. Yeah. And I think that's important. Yeah. When you're talking to your interviewees, I mean, how do you actually go about getting them to talk about what they talk about? Do you kind of switch on the camera and they go, or do you probe them? Do you uh, choose to disagree with them? Do you push them in certain directions? I mean, what, w did you, what kind of strategies I, I did you I chose occasionally to disagree with Tarantino, and that was very interesting, because as soon as I said something, anything contrary to his opinion, he would say, well, obviously we beg to differ, and that would be the end of the conversation. <laughs> uh, right. And that was when Tarantino started talking up films like Houseboat Horror. And that's when I suddenly went, hang on, everything he said before this made so much sense. Do I, now do I believe that stuff or not? Um, but with everyone else, I, I was lucky in that I'd put a lot of DVDs together for Umbrella and I'd, of these films and of our more mainstream, of all, our more classic films, I did everything from Picnic Hanging Rock to The Getting of Wisdom to Money Moon, oh, you know, yeah. a lot of different kinds of films. So I'd, I'd, I'd met uh, and interviewed a whole cross-section of Australian film industry at that point. So, and I think because they, they trusted me because they'd seen what I did with the DVDs, that they realised that I wasn't taking advantage of them, that I wasn't just, you know... And that meant that I could ring up Philip Adams and say, look, Philip, I'd really like you to be involved in this documentary talking about the stuff that you hate. Mm. And he was happy to do so. Yeah. Philip actually wrote a letter to the FFC supporting our documentary, saying, you know, even though I don't agree with any of these films, I think it's a really important tale that needs to be told. He does seem to have softened in his views a little over the years. Do you think? Yeah. He still hates Mad Max. Yeah, but not with the same kind of vehemence that... Uh, yeah that characterised, I think, was it in the bulletin? That yeah, the, porno that the pornography of violence, yeah. Mm. I, Philip's take on Mad Max is really interesting, and if not quite Hollywood ever get, gets expanded, hopefully it'll be included, and that is that Philip, his problem with Mad Max isn't the fact that it's, isn't the fact that it's so bloody and mean-spirited, it's the fact that it's so well-made. Mm. He can forgive a film that is all those things if they're amateurish. But because this film was so ma well made and showed a very, um, you know, uh, smart person behind the camera, he thought mm. it was even more dangerous. And that's a really interesting take on Mad Max. But for somebody as liberal as... For someone who fought censorship so absolutely. hard... Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is quite a... It's very... It's an acronym, mm. isn't it? Mm. Well, why not... Um... But the, other, the other good thing was... So, so I could approach people like Hal McElroy and say, you know, I want you to talk about your giant pig movie. Yeah. And, you know, these people were, were happy to do so. Yeah. Why not Colin Bennett? Because Colin Bennett was a really significant he was. target of uh, 
the ire of these, uh, of many of these filmmakers, not all of them. So you're assuming we didn't make constant phone calls to Colin Bennett? Yeah. No, we, I wasn't actually. I thought you might. Yeah, might we did. Have. Colin wasn't interested in being on camera. He said, you can come to my house, you can go through my archives, you can do whatever you want, but I don't want to appear on camera. Hmm. So, yeah. We I really don't know why. He's always been very presentable. So we, we tried to get Colin. Yeah. Justin, Justin, the researcher, spent a lot of time on the phone with yeah. Colin. Um, and in the end, we just had to make do with Bob Ellis. <laughs> And look, it was important, that was the other thing, that I'd seen a lot of documentaries recently where they interviewed people who had no connection to the films at all. Mm. They interviewed people who are now experts or who are reviewers now, who weren't even born when the films came yeah. out. Yeah. And I said, I don't want to do that, I want to have people, apart from the people, the new generation of filmmakers, and I thought that was really important to have them, to show that this, there is a legacy to these films. Yeah, I mean, that was really interesting, the, the, the Saw, the influence yeah. on Saw. And, 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 and Wolf Creek and films yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I also wanted to have just the people who were there fighting in the trenches. And, you know, people said, why didn't you have David Stratton? I said, well, at that point, he was running the film festival. Yeah. He wasn't really involved in reviewing these films back then yeah. and so forth. So, you know, I thought it, it, there needs to be really... It's the only chance that the guys who are in the trenches are going to have a ch chance... And the girls who are in the trenches we are going to have a chance to tell their story. So, you know... That raises another thing that I wanted to ask you. Did you get the sense that you were entering a kind of boys club because it's I mean yes there are some women actresses mm. female actresses that that you interview but it's kind of it seems to be the men who are kind of calling the shots was it was, did you get that sense as you were putting it together I never I never thought about that kind of stuff because I, it wasn't that we didn't want to interview women or anything like that. There were no, no, no women no. making films. This like wasn't that. really so much a question about what you chose yeah. to cover, but it was about the period. I, 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 I know what you're saying. It, you can think that, but when I spoke to the actresses, they all said that they felt very much in control, hmm. at least early on. When they were doing, you know, when they were doing the Alvins and when they were doing, um, you know, the, the early... Um, R-rated films, they very much felt that they weren't being exploited, that it was a chance. And I sound strange talking about this personally because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I had nothing to do with this time. Mm. I only know what I'm told by these people. Mm. And, you know, you can take this with a grain of salt or not. But a majority, 99% of the actresses felt that they were in control, that if they didn't want to do something, they could say they didn't want to do it. And they were listened to. Right. But they had no problems with what they were asked to do until later on. And that was, Deborah Gray made a point of saying it. She bowed out when she saw that suddenly violence started getting mixed with nudity. And that was sending out a totally different message. Before, the message that was getting sent out was that we are women, we are heterosexual women who are having fun engaging in this content on screen. Mm. And, um, and, you know, they say that's, that's some kind of message that isn't even in Australian films these days which is interesting. Mm. And that at the time, you know, they thought that that was something good to be portraying on screen and interesting. And certainly with the ease in censorship, it was something that was important to be portrayed on screen. Mm. And obviously, a little bit later on, you had a lot of producers who suddenly saw dollar signs when they saw that ca cash register ringing every time there was a naked woman on s set in an Australian film. And obviously, that's why the films, you know, do become exploitative as, as the period. And it's interesting that when you get to a film like um, like Phantasm, uh, Ghanaian card Richard finding, Bruce. Directed by the great Richard Bruce, mm. now retired, uh, that you can't, they couldn't find actresses who would appear in that content on yeah. screen. So obviously things had shifted quite dramatically by then. Yeah. Mm. Can you remember how you, so I know you this has happened over a number of years, but can you remember how you worked out the structure for the film? You know, the chapter headings and the, um, you know, it, it, it strikes me, it's, it's like a book. Yeah. You know, with, that, with those headings and then we see, you know, discussion of, of well, that particular aspect. It, I mean, it, it, for yeah. example, um, uh, Ockers, Knockers, <laughs> Pubes and Tubes, for right. example. Yeah. Um, <coughs> a great, a great, zappy headline. Uh, well, that grab, encapsulates grab the period too, doesn't it? I would have thought. Um, oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, that's... But how did that, you know, what was the process by which you came to that, it, those it kind, all, of, that it, kind of breakdown? Well, 
I kind of realized that there wasn't a lot of crossover between the filmmakers and the, and the genres that they worked in. And so not to confuse things and have everything choppy and to be able to, be able to establish some personalities throughout the film, it seemed to, to work in three genres was the way to do it. Because you found that the first genre was obviously Tim Burstall and John Lamont's genre. The second one was obviously um, you know, Ghanaian and Terry Burke to, to a lesser extent. Yes. And the third one was Brian Trenchard Smith, George Miller and a couple of other you know, people who did yeah. fringe things. And with, with a few exceptions, they didn't cross over. Obviously, Brian had made The Love Epidemic, but you know, that was part of Hex again anyway. John had made Sky Pirates, but we weren't really going to focus on that a hell of a lot. And Ganane had made Phantasm, but that was his only kind of foray into that stuff. So yeah. that seemed to be the easiest way to, to establish the personalities within the genres. And, there wasn't mm. and also, it seemed that um, almost in timing, there wasn't a lot of crossover either. You know, we had the, 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 the ochre and the sex films that started off the industry, and we had our action films that really ended the industry. And the horror films sort of fitted somewhere in between, but they kind of petered out really before the end of the, the period. So uh, that just seemed the easiest way to go. Look, culling it down and turning it into 100 minutes was a huge process. Mm. And there was obviously a lot of push-pull between information and entertainment. And obviously, unfortunately, you know, to some extent, it's a shame that entertainment won out. Um, but, you know, we, we had, we, we cut segments of, you know, all the social kind of context stuff that was, you know, 40 minutes an hour in duration. Yes. And we just had to cull it down to whoever said the most uh, concise point that sort of summed up everyone else. So it didn't matter who it was, whoever said it the most concisely we used in the film. Right. So, you know, that it's, in, a, in a way it's a shame to me that a lot of the stuff that I thought was interesting um, has been squeezed so much. But, you know, it was all about the doco also reflecting the sensibility of the films, which meant that it had to be entertaining. Right. And it certainly does that. I mean, it catches the... The passion. Well, hopefully, the, the, the kind of the, the, the larrikin spirit, I think. Well, it does, but I didn't believe a word of it. You know, I, it, there are all these, these series of apocryphal stories that. Wonderful stories. Which ones don't you believe? Because we've researched every one of the stories <laughs> in the film. I made sure that we found Ooh. out that that guy was shot on the set of Turkey Shoot with a real oh, right. bullet. Okay. Um, and the Dennis Hopper one is, that is, is true. true. Um, I mean, I know that secondhand. I don't yeah. know that firsthand, but I remember people talking well, Richard, about Richard it. Richard Brennan at the time. talks about he was a guy who had to be with Dennis. He was a guy who dropped Dennis off and had to be at the police station with Dennis, and he swears to me that it's true. This is Mad Dog Morgan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, all the stories about you know setting people on fire on the Man from Hong Kong. They all that all depends on who you listen to. <laughs> Brian Brian states now that George didn't punch him, but everyone else on set says that George did. There's a line from the man who shot Liberty Valens, you know, when the yeah. legend becomes fact, print the legend. Yeah. Um, and I got the feeling that what I was watching was hugely engaging, yeah. but that I was, I was getting a legend. That well, what's interesting though, that I think the legend only happens when these stories are told and told and told and told and told. A lot of these, films, this, these stories, these guys haven't told these stories. You know, so a lot of them are being told for the first time and they're racking their memories. So that might be a part of the reason why the memory's playing up. But I don't think that they've morphed into other stories over the years because they're not stories that have been constantly told and retold. So, you know, no, I'm, 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 willing I'm, to, I'm willing to believe a fair few I'm of them. I'm seeing them from a different angle. Um, and I, because I, 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 I grew up, yeah. these were the films yeah. that were being released around me. And, um, but I also know. think enough time has passed now where people can tell these stories and not feel... I feel that they can. Like back in those days, you know, it was, it's not like doing an EPK where all you have to do is sit down and tell great stories about your film. Now people don't care what they say, and uh, you know the truth can be told. Yeah. And maybe it's because you know maybe it's interesting. I, I about the three people dying on Yankee Zephyr. I thought, well, I should. Someone told me it was mm. two. Someone told me it was three. Someone told me it was four. I thought, okay, I'll go to the avocado plantation. That surely, in its in its entry on Yankee Zephyr, has to mention the people who were killed on the set. Yes. It's not mentioned in that. Yeah. So some of these stories, obviously, just were never put down into print. Yeah, I remember it being one. Right. But, but that's, that's memory. I haven't well, read it. Well, I think when the producer's telling you it's three, it's in the producer's best interest to tell you it's as few people as possible. Well, it's true. So I, yeah. I kind of believe Tony in that yeah. sense, that, you know, that literally the, the 
two people were killed in the boat. One was airlifted out and died in hospital later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I ask this question general, genuinely, n not at all condescendingly, because it can equally be directed at me about a lot of other things, but why spend so much time and energy on such minor material? In the overall scheme of things, why do it? Because no one else is going to do it. You know, if, if it wasn't me, who was going to do it? Yeah. And I always had the feeling that there was a bunch of these filmmakers, not all of them, but a few of them, who were just as skilled in the craft of making films as our more acclaimed filmmakers. People who were made just as polished and interesting films, but because they worked in this genre, were never given the respect that they deserved. And that's Richard. It's to, a, to some extent Colin Eagleston. Long Weekend is a great film. Colin's other films aren't, but mm. Long Weekend is a great film. And Brian, whatever you think of Brian's later films, whatever you think of most of his films, you know, just the fact that the man from Hong Kong still moves like it does these days, mm. I mean, that's, that is, in that genre, that is masterful. And I can well understand why your Weirs and your Beresfords and your Armstrongs and your Skepsis have achieved the fame and the accolades because they deserve it. Mm. But these guys deserve some spotlight shone on them because they just chose to work in a different genre. Mm. And who else is going to do it? Mm. Um, are there any sequences that you put together but didn't use and that we're going to see on the, the DVD? Yeah, we had about 70 choice? minutes of fully cut sequences that just, you know, I had to had to cull. But you've still got them? Yeah, and hopefully they'll end up on the DVD. Right. And that, they were just more other film titles that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, had already been covered by other films or just slowed the film down. And um, things like um, uh, 2,000 Weeks, which, I, which was 2,000 Weeks in the set were in there from the very start. And at the last minute, they just had to go. Mm. Um, because it, Stork seemed to be the, the film that really crossed over more than 2,000 Weeks. Mm. Um, things like Scoby Malone, which I, which is such a, a great miscalculation, had mm. to be in there, and no one had ever spoken about Scoby Malone. Right. So there's Judy Morris and Jack, uh, talking about that. We interviewed Henry Thomas about frog dreaming. It was a real shame to cut Henry out of the doco, but at that point, the st Brian story d it kind of redeemed itself, making BMX Bandits, and we didn't really want to know about another Brian Trenchard Smith film up until Dead End Driving, which is kind of the end of that period, so yeah. that's why Frog Dreaming had to go. Um, mm. Films like Allison's Birthday ha had a segment, which got taken at the last minute. Just things like that. So, and there was a lots of extended, so Turkey Shoot went for a lot longer because there was a lot more stories that you probably won't believe either <laughs> about, um, you know, about shooting in, in, in dams where you know, literally there were crocodiles laying their eggs two minutes before the shot. So, yeah. um, <laughs> and you know, just the farmer going, uh, lighting the cane, going, which way is the, um, the wind blowing? Okay, we'll light it, it'll go that way. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of extra stuff that'll hopefully end up on the DVD. And look, yeah. in a perfect world, I'd really hope that, if, that someone will say, let's expand this to a three-part TV series and see what we can do there. Because mm. I think a three by one hour would be a good format for this material too. And it would be en enable you to reassess the material and... Yeah. And yeah, yeah. 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 Jamie Blank says at the end, um, these films are coming back. Now, is he doing this just because he shot a remake of Long Weekend, or do you think he's got a point? I mean, I know there are a couple of films, yeah, but... Look, uh, you know, I, I think that in a sense these films are coming back because we didn't make these films for a long time and now we're making them. I mean, in that sense they're coming back. Yeah. Are they finding audiences? Well, you know, you'd have to say no. You'd have to say that, you know, Wolf Creek found an audience and that's where it begins and ends. Yeah. Um, if Rogue had been a huge hit, the genre film industry in Australia might be in a much better shape. And even the um, horror films that we're making are no bigger than the kitchen sink dramas that we're making. They're still very small scale horror films. So I would like to think that there is a chance that they can come back, but we need someone with a bit of clout like, you know, like an Eric Banner or like someone like that who's got the power to get these films up and want to make. Like we've got the star. I mean, the difference back then is we didn't have stars in our films. Mm. We didn't have Australian actors who could, you know, help could sell films. Now we have. Thus, we imported. Yeah. And, and, and now, yeah. now we have got some people who might say, yeah. "I want to make one of these films in Australia, an Amer American-style genre film, but make it, given an Australian sensibility, and make it in Australia." Yeah. 
And look, a lot of people say, I've had a lot of interviews where people say, surely you must think that Australia, making Baz Luhrmann making Australia is bad for Australian film. Because, you know, it's the antithesis of these genre films. But, you know, if we can make any kinds of films that suddenly will encourage world cinema goers and Australian cinema goers to go and see Australian films, yeah. then, you know, the industry is going to be good on every level. On every level. And yeah. if we can make films that cover all bases and for all audiences, then it's going to be even better. And, you know, let's hope that, let's hope that that happens.